Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to We Need to Talk About Fracking. Uh, my name's Joseph Corey. Um, I've been in business all my life, um, working in brands and stuff. And uh, I also have a charitable foundation called Human Aid. And Human Aid is the organisation that has been um, uh, sponsoring or paying for uh, this campaign uh, about fracking and about talking about it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Um, as you will probably know, charities are not obliged to uh, discuss who gives them funding, um, but for the sake of transparency, it's just so you all know, and we also know that you know, in other areas of uh, charitable foundations, they particularly don't tell people who funds them. Um, for the sake of transparency, I can tell you that it's myself, my mother Vivian Westwood, and Lush, the cosmetics company, that have paid for this particular project in trying to um, educate or trying to uh, talk about fracking anyway, and to get people talking about it and trying to investigate it for themselves. Um, first of all, uh, regrettably, on one hand, this is not the debate we had wished for. Um, we had gone to our best efforts to try to invite the uh, pro-fracking side um, to come and discuss with us and have a proper debate. Um, however, they have either declined our invitations or have stalled us or have not managed to kind of get themselves together enough to kind of come and debate. So we have a panel discussion instead of that. It's worth noting that I think some credit should be given to Dan Biles MP, by the way, because he was initially very enthusiastic about joining in the panel and talking to us, um, but seems that uh, he wasn't able to persuade anybody else to come with him. Um, what else do I want to say? I want to say that uh, nine months ago, uh, I didn't really know anything about fracking. I'd heard a little bit about it, and um, I started at that point to investigate it and to try to research what it really meant. And what I found gave me a lot of concern. Um, as a result of that, that's why we decided together that something needed to be done particularly when we realise that the government is in the process of licensing up to 65% of the UK landmass for fracking, yet the majority of the country have no idea what it is. Um, this is a question about our democracy to me as much as anything. Um, it's a question of a situation where you have a government with no uh, democratic mandate to be pushing this thing through. David Cameron's government coalition was brought in under the banner of the greenest government ever. Nobody voted for this, yet we have legislation being rushed, bef rushed through Parliament that seeks to even uh, sweep away the rights that we have to stop people in trespass uh, drilling even under our homes and under our farms. Um, what have we learned? Well, we've been to uh, all the... Uh, um, countries around the UK. We've been to Scotland, England and Wales. Um, we've been to the towns. We've spoken to the people. Uh, they were also uh, slightly disappointed that nobody would show up for the pro-fracking side to answer the valid questions that they had. In some instances, we've been uh, touched by the fact that people um, who had come to those events initially on the pro-fracking side and support of fracking, um, the very fact that nobody turned up to defend uh, the pro-fracking side, by the end of the, the um, discussion rather than debate, they had decided to change their minds purely because no one had turned up on the pro-fracking side. Anyway, um, we also uh, decided to uh, try to gather together as much as we could the questions and the genuine concerns that people had around the country about what fracking meant to them so that we could sort of pull that information, put them into clear questions and put them forward to the government so that we could go back to those people and give them the answers. 
For example, we now know that uh, legal in general have said that anybody living within a two mile radius of a fracking site is likely to have their properties devalued by 25%. The insurance industry has also had advice that many of these drilling companies will not be insurable and people's house prices, uh, houses will uh, not be insurable either, or if they are, the premiums are likely to rocket. Now that's nimbyism to a certain degree, but uh, what comes out of that, and me coming from a background in small business and growing something from a, an incubation stage of business, knows that the majority of the time, if you're getting small business loan finance, the majority of the time that loan finance is secured against your property. What's it going to mean for people when the bank suddenly finds out that actually the collateral that you've put up is either worth 25% less or has no value at all because it's unmortgageable, because it's uninsurable? This can have a great effect on our local economies and our economy as a whole. So that's one of the kind of things that we've found out. Um, that's about it. I don't want to sort of spend any more time. I can see that... John Snow is here, um, he's just arrived and I'm very pleased to see you John. Uh, we'd like to show you a small film of uh, the sort of uh, word from the street as it were, from all of the little towns that we visited and, um, and what people had to say. Uh, thanks very much. Fracking. I don't even know what it means. It's something to do with computers isn't it? It was a term from Vietnam War where they blew up their officers. The, the fracking is fracking, kicking lumps out of people or... I know a little bit about fracking, not a great deal. I think it's when there's drilling and it like cracks up the land, but I'm not sure what the purpose of the drilling is. Something to do with g g releasing gas. Um, apparently it's not very good for the environment from what I've heard. It's an energy crisis at the moment. We need to find more source of energy. I don't know whether I'm for fracking or not for fracking because, to be honest, I don't know too much about it. All, all, all the thing I know is what I've heard off the media. I don't feel like I have been informed about it, uh, apart from protests that have been in the news. It's not really like widely publicised. Well, the problem is if no one understands it and, and the, that they're not told about it, then you get this apathy thing sinking in. and. If that happens, then the government can push through anything they want and no one cares. The, the funny thing is, it's something that's happening everywhere, and yet they, it's like they try to keep it undercover. They don't want you to know. I wasn't aware, really, that it was going to happen in Wales. Is it going to happen in Wales? If fracking was coming to, come to an area near me, yeah, I'd definitely want to know more about what it is. We should have the right to say, yes, this can happen, and no, fracking can't happen. You're a farmer in a rural community. And this dumpman comes along and says, hey, we're going to frack your land, pal. Oh, are you? Yeah? Well, I can assure you, you can go and frack yourself. Do I speak into this? I suppose I do. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for, for putting this gig together. Um, uh, well, uh, I am your objective, dispassionate chair. I'm with the man from Manchester. Don't know too much about it but I've had to talk about it on the news quite a lot. Um, I, I, I don't know, I'm between earthquakes in Blackpool and saving uh, the Americans' economic underpants. Uh, it seems, you know, you listen to one tale, you'll hear another. Um, so tonight, we're gonna try and talk about fracking and try to make sense of it. Now, we'd like to have made more sense of it because we did invite people from the industry and they didn't want to talk about it, which is interesting. Um, because, you know, there's plenty to talk about and they, they, they reckon they have a good story so it would be great to hear it. So we're putting out the offer again to talk at the next meeting that's going to be held where I'm going to turn up again and try to be a good, objective, balanced chair to reassure all sides that we can talk evenly about this issue uh, and we're going to have a deal on July the 14th. So you've got uh, three weeks to get your shits together, chaps. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we, we, we'd really, really, and chapesses, because there are women in fracking too, let's, uh, let's try to get a, a really even and interesting and informative debate together. But we're going to have it tonight too, because here on our panel, says he turning to his rather bicycle-infected uh, sheet of paper, because he got a bit tangled up in my chain, um, <laughs> on the end here, uh, Tina Louise, who I know as inveterate emailer, blogger, contactor, I've had her in my own inbox more than I think I've had my own wife. Um, 
Uh, we regard her as the battling grandmother um, from Blackpool. She has um, uh, suffered the, the shivers, uh, or whatever it was that happened when the quake occurred. Elizabeth Arnold, campaigner from Pennsylvania, uh, where they've been fracking for nine years. With, so we've got some experience there. Paul Mobbs, ecological futurologist, consummate expert on the science, politics, and economics of fracking. And that's what it says on my bit of paper. Um, down the end there, Mike Stein from the Trillion Fund, expert on renewables. He's, a, he's in with the renewables industry. Millie Darling says you're only 22, but I think you're more than that. You look, says you're only 22. Yeah. I'm impressed. Very good, very good. Climate campaigner and community-owned renewable projects activist. And John Ashton, a climate diplomat. And I'm really uh, extremely grateful to you for turning out, John, because you're in a sense, uh, you know, it when it comes to... Um, uh, perhaps a, 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 a balanced view. Uh, I'm it. an escape diplomat these days. I should stress that. I don't well, speak once a diplomat, language. always a diplomat. Very hard to shed the language, well, I find, when I talk to retired diplomats. But maybe you... I'm not retired. Ah. I'm not, what, what do you I do now? I may not be 22, but I haven't retired it. But, but, but you're not a climate I'm, I'm, diplomat. I'm an itinerant pontificator. Well, that's speaking, what we're looking for. Speaking only for myself. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Everyone's speaking for themselves. So, let's get the ball rolling. Tina Louise, because you've been in my inbox so often, I want you to start things going. You've experienced it in Britain, then we'll go to Pennsylvania. Good evening. Uh, Tina Rothery from Blackpool. And I used to start when we, we first found out about fracking two and a half years ago, when we had the first instance, I should be that, shouldn't I? Uh, we had the first instance of um, high volume hydraulic fracturing in this country in 2011. It led to two quite minor seismic occurrences, admittedly, and often you'll hear them talking about how it was only lightly felt. We actually never queried, oh, how light did that feel? We all wondered what on earth just happened underground and what caused that. It took Quadrilla over six weeks to admit it was them, and the whole time they were continuing to drill and frack and push slick water into a fault line. We have no idea when the payback from that goes. Um, so this was our first instance of hearing about fracking in Lancashire. Had it not been for those earthquakes, I don't doubt we would be knee deep in the stuff by now. So some of us found out about it. We formed a full small group called Residence Action on Fard Fracking. It was never intended to oppose something we didn't understand. And it was intended that we would just say, hey, slow down. Let's find out a little bit more about this before you decide to go on to the next leg of this. Because a moratorium was put in place and it wasn't released till December 2012. So we had that pause to gather our thoughts, gather our research and encounter people who had, in the States, brought us some knowledge of what it was actually like. So that rather than listening to Quadrilla or the government telling us, oh, statistically this and gold standard this and so on in their reports, we went and spoke to real people who lived it, breathed it, experienced it, saw their livestock die. We had people like Marianne Lloyd-Smith. She's a consultant chemist for the UN on toxicity. Come and speak to us. We spoke to um, other people who'd come over from Canada, from Australia, where they'd experienced it. And we found a huge cause for concern. And imagining at that point that this was a democracy, we all thought that if we signed the petitions, lobbied our MPs, and pushed in every lawful, legal way we could to object to all planning, that somewhere along the line, someone would see sense and wisdom. In two and a half years, this just doesn't happen. And we remain astounded that this stuff continues to plow through. They've just put through a 6,000 page document, planning document in Blackpool for the next genuine high volume hydraulic fracturing to go ahead. You'll hear a lot about the little sites throughout the country where there's exploratory drilling. This is not the same thing at all. This is just to get the well in and be one step ahead of planning. When they go to full production on 24 hour illumination, seven days a week, it's crazy. When I started this, um, getting involved in this, I used to say something like, I'm just a grandma from Blackpool. But now I very boldly say I'm one of the grandmas in this country who is damn well concerned with righteous reason to be about the future for my grandchild. She needs air and water. It would be very, very irresponsible of anyone in this room to leave that sort of awareness of the future to chance. 
Every one of us is responsible for what we leave behind. And you see the diversity in this room. We see that in all our community groups. There was a handful of community groups opposing this two and a half years ago. We are now 180 community groups strong. We have protectors on community protection caps that slow the trucks and allow us the time to do the research and get the information out so that more people have access to truth and can make their decisions based on a knowledge rather than just spin and marketing. Dean Louise, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Elizabeth Arnold, nine years in Pennsylvania uh, of fracking, uh, what's your experience been? Um, actually, the, the first permits were issued in 2002, but fracking really took off um, around 2007, 2008. Um, but before I speak, I really want to dedicate my three minutes to Terry Greenwood, who just passed away last Monday um, from a rare form of brain cancer that's linked to radiation. Um, and seven of his neighbors in this rural area of Pennsylvania that he lived in um, also have this same form of rare brain cancer. And we're, we're seeing um, all kinds of patterns that need to be studied in Pennsylvania right now. So I just wanted to dedicate my three minutes to, to Terry. Um, you, can check our, you can check the website to get his story, but he was very outspoken. He was one of the first people to come to Philadelphia and, and talk to us about what was going on in the shale fields. Um, so, yeah, we're up to about 9,000 fracked wells now in Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, I'm going to share some statistics as well, I'm sure the, the other panelists. And I just want you to really think about how that this plays out in people's lives across Pennsylvania and across the world in these communities where fracking and other forms of extreme energy extraction are taking place. These aren't just numbers, these are people's lives. Um, so 5% of wells fail immediately. This is according to the industry's own data. That means the cement casing around the, that's supposed to protect you know, contaminants from getting into the water supply and the other levels of the earth strata are, are it, it crumbles. Like the concrete that you walk on, like the house, you know, the, the cement that you use in your everyday life, it, it crumbles. And so 5% of wells will fail immediately and 50% will fail within 30 years. So these are leaving open, super highways open for these contaminants to travel um, and get into our water supply. And the, the list of hundreds of chemicals that are in the frac fluid, depending on the company, it'll be like 300 to 600 different carcinogens, toxic, you know, neurotoxins that are in the frac fluid. Um, these translate into, you know, health problems as well as the air pollution that comes off of uh, fracked wells when they're, they're flaring. Um, and the, I'm just going to quickly list some of the health symptoms, which include nausea, dizziness, headaches, nosebleeds, incoordination, numbness of the limbs, tremors, temporary limb paralysis, unconsciousness, ringing in the inner ear, skin rashes and lesions from bathing in the water um, that's contaminated, respiratory infections, swollen organs, digestive tract problems, and pain, pain in your bones, just to name a couple of the symptoms we've been seeing in Pennsylvania and across the US. Um, and of course, the mental health issues that come along with not initially knowing what's happening to you and the emotional hardship that comes along with losing your health and seeing your family in pain and your life uprooted from the land you can no longer live on. And of course, the frustration and betrayal that comes with being ignored and lied to by the agencies that are supposed to protect you. Um, our state governor, like your government here, has lied to the public about water contamination. We have over 150 cases of documented water contamination in Pennsylvania, as there are documented cases of water contamination in other states in the United States. And these were determined by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, which has really not been a department that has protected us, but, but even they admit in these over 150 cases that it was, this water was contaminated due to fracking. So if anybody wants a printout of those documents, I'm happy to give them to you after. Um, hundreds of families in Pennsylvania are still waiting to get their water tested and to have it determined what exactly is in it and where that came from, um, as are people in Texas, Wyoming, Colorado. Um, and in the meantime, we are supplying water for our for for communities. So we're fundraising to get you know, and and local churches and local communities and neighbors are are buying water and and delivering it to the homes of people who've 
literally been living without water that they can drink with, cook with, or bathe in for years now um, because the, the companies and the government are not taking responsibility or, or fulfilling their obligations. So this is what's happening in Pennsylvania, but I really want to stress that it really doesn't matter where you live or what the geology under your feet is. Our bodies respond to these toxins the same. And the radio, it's not just the toxins in the frac fluid, it's the radioactive material that comes up to the surface when, with the frac fluid when, after you frac. The, um, the, the radioactive material is, you know, there's different types of radiation that come back in the frac fluid, and, and I can tell you more about that after, but, but there's not a lot of time. Um, but it, it could actually be even worse in the UK in the sense that, you know, people have signed leases in the, U in the US. They have legal documents that say, you know, they have a right to X amount of money or X amount of responsibility with these companies, and yet they've been betrayed, they've been cheated, and, and, and that's, that's with a signed contract. In the UK, you're not going to get a signed contract. The government's going to frack under your feet whether you want it to or not. They're going to let these companies come in and they're not going to consult you and they're not even going to have to deal with you. So you should, you should be worried and you should continue to fight as hard as you have been and as hard as you can. So in conclusion, um, you know, these gas companies aren't obligated to provide us with cheap energy in the United States or in any country. They will sell to the highest bidder. So this myth of energy independence is, is a myth. And, but we have no obligation to allow them to profit at our expense. And our movement is global and together we'll build our own brighter future for ourselves. Thanks. So Paul, uh, t t two who have lived or do live with fracking, uh, you're a scientist. Uh, from your perspective, the science. I'm actually an engineer. Well, well which, that, which that, that's me, science to me. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> science, but I can fix things. Um, <laughs> I have the dubious honour of being one of the longest serving researchers on this. I started this in 2009. Not a lot of people realise this all began under the Labour government. And what happened when we had the coalition government, it changed gear, and it's just happening a lot faster. And what I specialise in is research, finding huge quantities of data, and then mapping it all as how it all fits together. And it, it's a really interesting pattern that's emerging. Back in November 2012, David Cameron gave a speech to the CBI saying, you know, we're not very good at doing things in this country. What we're going to do is, number one, we're going to stop people judicially reviewing us. Number two, we're not going to consult the public. Number three, we're not really going to worry about the legal niceties, we're just going to press on and do all this. And that's precisely what they've done in the last two years. So in July 2013, Eric Pickles imposed a new set of planning guidelines on fracking. Every set of planning guidelines for the last 20 years has been consulted on. This was just imposed without any public consultation. July 2013, we also had the Treasury instructing the Environment Agency you will not take 13 weeks to determine an application for a pollution permit. You will do it in two weeks. And these are very complex technical documents, as we heard, you know, 6,000 pages for a plan application. You know, in two weeks, you cannot do the due diligence required to make sure that you, you check all those potential ways you could damage the environment. Recently, the government's tried to justify its case. Now, what we should be looking at is not so much why there is opposition, as to why the government's placatory words do not placate us. And it's because they're hollow. They have absolutely no substance whatsoever. And after five years looking at this in Britain, I can say that it just makes no sense. And their two recent reports, the, the Mackay Stone report on climate change, which came out in September last year, it's an interesting review, but it takes a very low figure for emissions that is not borne out by the most recent research in America, Australia, and Canada and divides that figure by a very high figure for gas production per well, which is two and a half times higher than some of the figures that the United States Geological Survey use, to produce an artificially low figure for how much it will affect the climate. If you reproduce their model, put the correct figures in from the latest research from North America, you find it's just as bad as coal. But for me, it, what I would call the dodgy dossier was the, the Public Health England report, which came out in October last year, where they said, we're going to look at all the research on the health impacts of shale gas. 
up until December 2012. There are more papers produced on this issue in the first four months of this year than from 2009 to December 2012. So they basically put the blinkers on and said, we're going to look at this. And they've ignored the bigger body of research that's come out since. And this is a the problem. They're producing studies which are not necessarily wrong, but they're methodologically biased to produce the answer that they want. And with all respect to John, the media are not reporting this. They are repeating an awful lot of what... <laughs> They are repeating an awful lot of what the lobby groups say. But again, they're not here to defend these words. And I would, I, for the last five years, I've been trying to get into an arena with these people. Perhaps arena is the wrong term. Um, and, and put this to them. But they will not defend these words in public. Because I, once, one time I did get a very nice man from Quadrilla. But they are very easy to knock over. And I'm, I'm just amazed that, to date, the media hasn't knocked over some of these very easy dominoes. I, 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 I seem to find myself holding the microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I would say the media is as ignorant as a citizen as to the pluses and minuses. Uh, well, why? Because it is an extremely complex business. I mean, he's just mentioned nuclear, coal, oil, gas, right? And then you have fracking. And, and what we know is that this country, because of poor governance in the past, uh, has produced 2% dependence on renewables. So we, how do we make up the difference and keep the lights on? And at the moment they say we can buy time with fracking, right? Would we rather buy time with nuclear? There, an OECD report came out in 1999. No, uh, yes or no? I, I, I will say because nobody ever says this. An OECD report in 1999 said if we went nuclear to solve climate change, we would run out of uranium in 12 years. There's not enough uranium to go nuclear. Let alone the safety issues. We just don't have the fuel. Um, secondly, coal. If, if it's no worse than, than fracking, keep coal going. Why can't we talk about conservation? You, you're presupposing... Uh, to keep, well, well, to keep you, the lights on. You can't on. keep the lights on with ah, conservation. No. That's the problem. Only 1% only of our... Any, only 1% of our energy consumption keeps the lights on. It's really easy to keep the lights on. Well, keep all the other things going. That's a different issue. And then you're talking about economic policy, which has nothing to do with energy. It's about what sort of economy we want and what we want to get out of that. Why did we go digital broadcasting when it uses 10 times more power for transmission and reception if we need to conserve energy? Because people wanted to go digital. Who wanted to go digital? It was the, the, the broadcasters. Consumer. The broadcasters. Can I, can, I, can I try and answer your question, why can't we buy time with fracking? Yes. Because we're 20 years behind the Americans on fracking, and the conditions, the conditions here for doing it are far less conducive than they, than they are in America anyway. So even if the resource turns out to be on the scale that the fracking advocates think it is, and even if we threw the kitchen sink at it, it may, it may give us a, a minor change to our energy situation 20 years from now. Our energy problems are today problems. And a 20-year response isn't an answer to a today problem. That's why we can't buy any time with fracking, whatever we think about climate change. Well, we'll come back to the today problem in just a moment. Let's, let's now just turn um, to um, Michael. And uh, Michael, you're about renewables, but you're not going to pretend you're going to have renewables in business at a sort of 80 or 90 percent level at all soon. Uh, that's correct. Uh, my views, and I'm here in my personal capacity, um, is that fracking is a distraction. I'm totally aligned with John Ashton. Um, I believe that at a global level, unless we solve the problems of carbon emissions urgently, um, none of us will have any lights to turn on. Um, we're all going to be facing a rather uncertain and, and, and disastrous future. So my view is that there will be some form of agreement, a global agreement within the next five years. Uh, if there isn't, we're all r in real trouble. Um, I think that issues like the Somerset floods are just a, a, a foretaste. If you look at Somalia and you look at the underlying causes of piracy, it relates to desertification of Somalia, and that relates to climate change. So if we actually want to solve the problem, we've got to think really big and think like a big nation, which is Britain. And it's my adopted home because it's full of amazing creative energy. And I think it, it, it is extraordinary to me that 
uh, the home of democracy. Um, we live in a world where politicians are, have five-year electoral cycles trying to solve a 25-year generational issue called climate change. And I think that if we keep thinking like politicians and we're driven by five-year business plans, I've never seen a business plan in business that's longer than five years, um, to try and solve a problem like climate change, we are going to be in big trouble. And I believe that fracking is just part of a distraction. We need to get our energy and our rare capital resources, our, our financial resources, focused on a sustainable future, a renewable future, um, however that happens. Uh, and, and so again, I'm with John. We are 20 years behind America. Uh, this is a complete distraction. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the industry and the way every industry overstates its claims. I mean, I'm a medical doctor by background. You know, in the 1940s, we were promoting cigarette smoking. Okay, so every industry, you know, uh, does its thing uh, in, in the time. But it beggars common sense uh, to, to believe that fracking in our green and fertile land, which is a small land compared to the United States, is going to even give us minor relief in terms of carbon emissions. Michael, uh, just, uh, just, 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 just a quick one before we move on. Um, the United States is responsible for 25% of the world's carbon emissions, right? That's, that's agreed. Britain is responsible for 3%, right? I mean, Britain could come up with something which perhaps does invade our carbon emissions, but there is no evidence that the United States is doing anything about it at all. And of course, if it goes to fracking, that won't make any difference either. I was in New York two weeks ago. The temperature, the average temperature in every building I went into was somewhere around 48 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, kind of, um, you know, 15 um, uh, centigrade. I mean, seriously cold. You needed a sweater on. I mean, there's not even the beginnings of an attempt to do anything. So, in a sense, anything we do is neutralized by them. And the Canadians, yes, with, uh, with the coal tar sands. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with you that, that, that this is a global issue. Um, but Britain, uh, as a nation, has got a, a, an unusually large voice for the size of its nation around the Security Council. I think that it, it, it's time for our leaders to really grasp the nettle and start a, a powerful lobby, uh, which John, in fact, has you know, led and, and, and I would hope would re-lead it, if you like. But I think that uh, we've got to persuade our own leadership through our voting patterns that this is an issue that affects us all. And if we can't persuade the Americans, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, everybody, um, we're in serious trouble. Um, and so I think that... Uh, okay, yeah. we'll, we'll return to that. Millie, uh, give us your perspective. Okay. Um, so, hello, my name's Millie, and I'm going to talk about community energy projects um, because I am really passionate about investment in renewables, and I see communities as having a big part in that. Um, so, up and down the country, communities are coming together to form energy cooperatives, and people become members of these co-ops, they um, buy shares in the co-op, and then the co-op uses that money to install renewable energy on local buildings or at local sites. This electricity is then sold to the grid or sold to the site, and the um, money goes back to the members of the co-ops or into community funds that can fund initiatives such as energy efficiency or youth work in the local areas. So I'm involved in an energy co-op that's been set up in Hackney, where we're planning to install 120 kilowatts of solar on some big flat roofs on an estate. Um, and this will save 41 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year as compared to grid electricity. And we're also um, running an internship programme on the estate with young people from the estate who are learning about the cooperative business model and will be involved in the installation. Um, another example of an energy co-op that's recently been set up is in Balcombe. And Balcombe last summer became the poster child for fracking. And there were many protests down there, and that get, got lots of people in the village thinking about um, energy and their energy use. So they got together, they formed an energy co-op called Repower Balkum, and they've got, they're planning to generate the equivalent of 100% of their village's electricity needs from renewable so sources. Um, and they've already got their first site lined up, so they'll be installing solar panels on a big flat roof or in or a, a local farm this summer. So, <laughs> so,
So the benefits of these projects are that they bring people together, and that's basically the opposite of what fracking's done. They bring communities together to come up with democratic, environmentally sustainable solutions. All the money stays within the community. Um, and it, it's happening. It's happening across the country at the moment. Um, so just in conclusion, climate change is going to be disastrous if we don't deal with it now. I'm 22, as John said earlier, and it's my generation that's going to have to deal with the consequences of the generation above us burning so many fossil fuels, going into fracking. We don't want that. We want something different. We want investment in renewables, and we want to see um, communities coming together across the country to do this. So, yeah, I'll just finish saying, let's do it. Let's unite to invest in community renewables. <laughs> Thank you, Millie. Back. We'll come back to um, uh, some of those things uh, in a moment. John, why don't you give us your perspective? John, thank you. I think I've been invited here to say something about climate change. I mean, it's really not complicated, and it doesn't take three minutes to do that bit. Um, you can be in favor of fracking for shale gas, or you can be in favor of fixing the climate. But you can't be in favor of fracking for shale gas and fixing the climate. You can't. And The reason, the reason for that is to fix the climate, we need to build a carbon neutral energy system. That means using electricity to get our heating and our transport. It means um, using energy much more efficiently than we use it at the moment. And Britain, disgracefully, is one of the most energy wasteful countries in Europe uh, right now. Um, and it means taking carbon emissions out of the electricity system through renewables. We know how to do all of that. We have the technologies to do all of it. Um, and actually, we can afford to do it. We can afford to do it. If we do it in a smart way, we can afford to do it in a way which is good for the economy in the short term as well as the long term. Um, and to those who say, well, it's going to take too long. I mean, Germany last month had a morning where it was getting 60% of its electricity from renewables. And it now has moments where it's generating more than 100% of its demand. From, from renewables, and that's because they've had active policies to bring, this, to bring this forward. As for the diplomacy, I mean, we, John, we don't exist in sort of separate, hermetically separated boxes. We copy each other. And, you know, when I was a climate change envoy, I was going around the world trying to build alliances with people to push up the level of ambition in other countries. I've just come back from China. And in Britain, in China, believe it or not, Britain has a reputation for being a pioneer in building the low-carbon economy. And that has greatly strengthened the forces in China who want to do the same thing, ironically, who have now become much stronger in their system than the, the sort of equivalent forces in our system. But if people start to look at us and say, actually, that's stopped now in Britain, and, they're go and what they're doing now is to locking themselves back into the high-carbon economy through fracking, then I'm afraid that cuts off our diplomacy at its knees and greatly weakens not just the British effort, but the global effort. Um, I've nearly used up my time, but I just want to say one other thing. I mean, I left the government two years ago because I, I was becoming increasingly concerned at the growing gap between British politics and the British people. Um, and the growing gap between the view of the economy, which seems to be sort of held within, at least within the kind of mainstream of British politics, and the real economy, which is something that the British people understand, particularly after the events of 2008. And the debate about fracking is a perfect illustration of those two gaps. Politically, what this is about is to create short-term opportunities for people who are not from the communities where they're going to be operating, to do something which is far more disruptive as, as Tina Louise has been, has been saying so eloquently, um, than they're pretending at the moment. And in a way where all of the costs and all of the risks are to be borne by the communities themselves. It's fraudulent, politically. And, and economically, it's an illusion. It just doesn't do most of the things that are being claimed for it. Does it help to fix the climate? No, as I've explained. Does it displace coal from our energy system? No, because we're going to have to retire all of our coal 
in less than the time it would take to get that frack gas on stream anyway? Does it improve our energy security? Not particularly, because we'll be still be importing most of our... If we, if we keep gas in our energy system, it will still mostly be imported, at least for the next 20 years. Does it reduce the capacity of Mr. Putin to expose us to energy blackmail? No, we don't import gas from Russia. It doesn't do any of those things. And it doesn't offer any significant prospect of large-scale production, as I've said, for at least 20 years. And we need to solve our real problems in our energy system, not in 20 years, but in a much shorter, uh, in a much shorter time frame. What's missing is a serious conversation. And I, 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 do, I don't hold you personally responsible, John, but I do hold, <laughs> I do hold the, if you like, the system of which you're part, partly responsible for this. There, there is no serious conversation about the kind of economy we want to build in this country and the kind of country we want to be. And I think people are thirsty for that conversation. They want to rally about a positive vision for the economy that brings people together. And the main reason why I think fracking isn't a terribly good idea is because I think actually it's something that will drive people apart, not bring people together, and we need to be brought together. Thank you. Well, there are a lot of issues in play, and it seems to me the one unifying issue that has emerged from what everybody has said is that a new kind of economy has to be built. But, you know, that takes time. How quickly do you actually seriously think, Michael, that you could see a situation in which... I mean, actually, I think the German figure is 20% guaranteed renewables. And then after that, there are problems. Now, we have 3%, or 2%, actually, and no bigger than it was two years ago. So how quickly can you push 2% uh, to, let's say, 20% to catch up with the Germans? How quickly and how? Well, this is a nation that has fought two uh, world wars. Uh, this is a nation that, if it puts its mind to a problem, can solve that problem. Um, I've no doubt about that. Um, it's a question of will, and as John has pointed out, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, political leadership, and it seems to me that that leadership is going to have to come from the people, us, the people, people like John. Um, how quickly can you do it? In the means in the short term, you have to persuade people in the winter to wear sweaters in their houses, for example. Why not? Why not? Well, I, 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 I don't think so, because I think that we, we, we have alternatives. We have alternatives. We do have. We the do reason have I'm wind. pushing this question. Sure. The reason I'm pushing this question is that the argument being made by people who support fracking is that it buys us time to get developing all the other things. Well, of course, here uh, it's going to take so long uh, to get fracking. I believe going we anyway. need to build, John, interconnectors with Norway, uh, improve the interconnections with the rest of the continent to build a smart grid. Uh, we need to start that work now. Therefore, I believe the, the whole fracking debate is, is a distraction. We need to put our capital to work into building more solar. There's huge, vast areas, for example, uh, reservoirs that need to be covered over because of algal blooms in the summer uh, that could be covered with solar panels. As one example, in London alone, that's 150 megawatts of capacity right there. Um, so uh, companies, you know, for example, Thames Water are beginning to look at this. They need more encouragement and they are going to get that encouragement. Um, wind opportunities, you know, the whole debate of onshore, offshore, the government is certainly pushing offshore wind, which I think is an excellent thing, but we shouldn't forget onshore wind. And again, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of, you know, what these things look like, you know, how ugly they are and so on in terms of wind turbines, I'm reminded of Battersea Power Station and the whole debate of, cheapest. what an ugly building that was. And there was a massive planning issue around Battersea when it was built, you know, many, many moons ago. And today, it's a great <laughs> two-listed building. It, it's, 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 it's iconic. Uh, so I can see a time when, for example, wind turbines will actually look quite beautiful to people. I think it's a matter of perception. If things like Battersea Power Station can look beautiful to people, I think certainly wind turbines can look beautiful to people. And I think it's a question of priorities. If we want to prioritize... Let's bring it, bring it then to the core of the debate, because there are some people here who uh, do um, look at fracking for, from an essentially supportive position. One or two people here. And without caterwauling and the rest of it, I would really like a chance 
for one or two of them to say something, and then we will respond to what they have to say. And I believe Dr. Nick Riley is here. Dr. Nick, would you like to take this microphone and just give us a sort of re reaction to what you've heard and maybe the argument for fracking? Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's this on. It is on. Thank you. Just to give my credentials, I am actually a geologist. I did my PhD on shales. I come from Northwest England. Um, I grew up with coal mines around me, brick pits, quarries, steam trains, iron foundries, gasifiers, etc. Um, there's been so much said tonight. Where do I start? I think uh, John, you actually touched on two really important points. Um, and this is, if we are going to go through with a renewables future, uh, you touched on the fact that human behavior is very important, wearing a sweater. And the other is, it, it is quite a difficult thing to do. And Germany was mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of figures being banded about, and people are confusing figures such as how much electricity is generated on a certain day with the energy for a country. Can anyone tell me how much renewable energy is actually consumed in Germany uh, compared to its entire energy consumption. I think it's important that the things are in context and there's real factual debate here because, excuse me, just let me finish. Am I allowed to speak? Thank you. Um, I personally think we do need much more renewables in our energy future. I am uh, a geologist and I know about what climate change has done in the geological past. And I also know about ocean acidification, uh, which hasn't been mentioned tonight. So CO2 growing in the atmosphere is a massive threat. We do need to move to a zero carbon future. What I'm trying to tell you is that it's very, very difficult to get there and there's a huge amount of over-optimism, just as there could be over-optimism about how much gas is in the ground from fracking as well. Both sides of the debate seem to me to have flaws. And um, all I'm saying is, since no one seems to be able to answer the question about Germany, only 12% of Germany's energy is from renewables. They spent over 100 billion euros in subsidies to get to 12%. Their CO2 emissions are rising. Okay, I've got the German government figures. I actually was with the German minister earlier this year. Um, very happy to supply them. These are not my figures, they're the German government's own figures. So it's a, an incredibly long period of time to build that infrastructure up. Also, there are a lot of emissions associated with building that infrastructure. So you think of all the metal and the concrete and all the cabling you've got to put in. It is a massive, massive task. I'm not against us going there, but it isn't as simple as many people might think. And I think, you know, the, the evidence from Germany is it is exceptionally difficult, especially if you won't have nuclear in your mix, which is where Germany is as well. Austria also has a similar figure to Germany, despite the fact it has more hydro than any other uh, country in the EU. Nick, would you, would you take the question? I'm only going to take one or two right, from the okay. because we can go on all night. So the, the guy with the pencil, put your stick up, your pencil. There you are. How does that compare to how much we um, bailed out the banks? I think peak bank support is 1.2 trillion. How much did you say they took to get up to 12%? No, Germany has spent over 100 billion how much? euros how much? and it will be spending far more. Billion. Hang on. No, no, I've just told you the figure. Last October, they got to 100 billion euros of subsidy for renewables. They're locked in to many more um, millions, hundreds of millions of euros at least, because of feed-in tariffs. So I'm just telling you what it's cost Germany so far and where they are, okay? And they are seen as the lead country in this argument, as was stated from the panel here. I'll take one more question just at the back. The, the woman in the back with another pencil in the air. What is your view on, on combining the nuclear with, with fracking close by well, in a country like Well, they're completely separate technologies. Um, I personally think that to get to zero carbon is so difficult that to um, 
only have a renewables and energy efficiency future, you won't get there. You really do need nuclear in the mix. We've got to do it in 50 years if the two degrees Celsius limit is to be believed. I want to thank um, Nick Riley very warmly for stepping up, and we may call, back, call him back again uh, for, we may well call him back for further bits of information, but let me just get a reaction. Did you want to come in there? Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to mention the um, International Energy Agency report that came out recently that said we need to spend $46 trillion by 2035 to meet our energy needs and, and how much the United States in particular spends subsidizing the oil and gas industry. I don't think this is a question of money. I think as, as our other panelists have said, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And so it really is a question of the public and political will. That's a very interesting point because one thing, one, one thing it's worth mentioning, and I mean, the, 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 this is important, is that actually one of the reasons why Germany was able to get a lead on this was because of the reunification of Germany. If you go to Germany, the vast bulk of the wind farms are in East Germany. And they were able... Sorry? Well, as a matter of fact... But the great thing about it was they didn't really... Have, they could ride roughshod off the people who were so thrilled to get back into the Western world uh, that they just rolled ramshot across the farmland and the rest of it. No planning permission, nothing. They just put it up, which is great. But, I mean, that's the way you do it. You can't do it that in every country. Can, can I add can, that can, there's can, a 60% tax incentive for the fracking industry in this country, which is not happening to renewables. So if you talk about subsidies on renewables, well, by the same token, the shale gas industry is going to get a 60% tax break, so that money's not coming back into our economy. So it's just what name you give it. And I will just point out that what Nick Riley said about uh, the period of time required to build the infrastructure for renewables, we require a gas pipeline down the spine of this country to feed in all these shale gas wells. We've just, in, we've just been told in the budget that there would be an increase in the money used for infrastructure. What infrastructure do you believe it needs for a shale gas well? When you've got to take that shale gas, you'll have to convert it into a, a usable form of gas. The amount of infrastructure required for that surely is, is a huge amount too. He's bravely stepping up to the microphone. And I would just add that, uh, to me, none of the money in this matters when I'm looking personally at the future for our children. One of the reasons why uh, shale gas is potentially attractive to this country is because we do have a gas grid um, because of North Sea gas. And uh, most of our shale gas resources... Uh, which we still need to explore and find out, even if we can produce from them. We don't even know. Excuse me. No one. I'm here at my own expense. Thank you. Um, where was I? We have a very good gas grid in this country. There's no need to put a gas pipeline down the spine of the country. Just Google um, um, images and put gas grid UK and you'll see. And you can also... You can also generate electricity directly as well. Okay. I'll just tell you that I went, to the, uh, I went to the Outer Hebrides the other day to look at the state of the independence vote in Scotland. And I saw the very impressive wind arrays up there, at the wind farms, because it's the windiest place in Britain. But believe it or not, every wind farm out of the eight uh, turbines, three are idle. And when you ask, well, are they broken down? They say, no, uh, the national grid has failed to put the connector in to take the uh, energy off the, off the, uh, off the island. So there, there are... We need a grid. We need all sorts of things. Um, yeah. The question is whether we need fracking. issue, I think you called it over-optimism, and I just want to just raise that. And by the way, I, I do think we need to listen to each other with respect in this conversation. <laughs> this is a hard problem. It's not an easy problem. Dealing with climate change, building a modern energy system, even, even without the problem of climate change, is a hard problem. And Liz is absolutely right. It's about political will. It's about what kind of country do we want and how much effort we're prepared to, to, build, to make to build that country. 
I spend a lot of my time now seeking out and listening to people who were adults in the period immediately after World War II, because I think that's a really interesting reference point for this conversation. We came out of World War II with our cities bombed to bits. I remember bomb sites in the street where I was growing up, like gaps in a row of teeth. Um, we were far more in debt. We, our fiscal problem was far greater than uh, our fiscal problems today. And we were much poorer as a country. And yet, within a few years, we had rebuilt our cities. We had modernized our national infrastructure. Um, and we had also laid the foundation for a health service, a pension system, a, a, a welfare settlement that only now, 60 years later, is beginning to come apart. We did far more then than we're being asked to do now with far less. And I ask myself, if we could do that then, surely we can do it now, if that's what we really want as a country. Okay. Uh, right. If, if Jamie is speedy with the mic, I want to take a cluster of uh, questions and we'll then um, do a, a, a round robin of answers. So I would like, please, to start with the guy with glasses there, the, the, the one, and then the woman behind him, and then we'll come over here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep hi. a note of what, everything you say. Uh, hi, I'm Swarn McCarthy. I'm from Iceland, a country that, uh, with the exception of some imports of uh, oil, basically runs entirely on, on renewables. But on top of that, there's this really, really weird thing. I only moved to England a couple of months ago. And I'm wondering, you know, why do people not insulate their houses? Why, why do people worry about putting sweaters on in their houses when they could be putting sweaters on the houses themselves? <laughs> so, you know, okay, that, the, that. the options for energy efficiency are there, and you just have to take them and stop th uh, thinking in terms of really old, really broken infrastructure. Good, good, good point. Uh, and the woman behind. Hi, um, I'm just wondering what Dr. Nick might think about the uh, radon in the domestic supply that's currently being piped into the New York um, grid at the moment and how the UK would uh, manage the health risks that are currently completely illegal through the EU regulations that are very... Um, the, they're good regulations. Are we going to deregulate because of that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then I want to go over here. We'll, we'll go to the man in the hat, uh, the man in the hat with the beard, uh, and then forward to the man with the glasses. We'll keep your hand up so he knows which one you are. <laughs> man in the hat. Help get the microphone across. How are we going to fight the corruption? of the government and the multinational companies that are heading this fracking lark. And then if you could throw the microphone forward to the guy in glasses here, put your hand up again. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, just a general point I would like to make, um, obviously in terms of fracking and climate change, could the solution be actually in nature? Um, I've looked at it, I've done a lot of research for the past so two months, and particularly to the gentleman in the renewable industry. Um, are you aware of hemp as a possible a solution to the world's problems? Thank you. Is that him? Yeah. Did you say hemp? Yeah. Hemp, hemp, hemp. Yeah. And then, then one, one, one to this guy here, please. Oh, well, you, you take the question and then... Get... Okay. You and then, then you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'd just like to make a point. Yeah. Can you stand up so people okay, can Okay, good. And the point I want to make is that nobody's really paying attention to the global catastrophic crisis the whole world system is in. Capitalism isn't about to give anyone anything, and none of the solutions being proposed here is going to happen if the big corporations don't want to do it. And they're all desperate at the moment. They're locked into global trade war. It's the biggest crisis we've ever seen in history, and we're not going to solve anything until we sort out that problem. We need to have a revolution and get rid of this capitalist system. Then we can sort out all these other questions. Uh, well, uh, uh, in, 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 part, in part, you're in harmony with at least one leg 
of Vivian Westwood tonight. She's got the word revolution on one leg and climate on the other. So she's, she's halfway there with you. Um, right, let's take, uh, yes, you go ahead. There's no one here uh, tonight to uh, represent the views of the Carlyle group and such people, so perhaps I can try and kind of conceptualise them as I see them. And I, I would say, well, you know, we've got uh, trillions, we've got trillions of uh, investment they want you to stand capital. Up so they can see who you are. Yeah, uh, we, we've got trillions uh, in investment capital. You know, we need to get a return on that. And one way we can do that is fracking. You know, we've got the politicians behind us. They're going to subsidise it. They're going to give us tax breaks. And then you're saying, well, it's going to muck up the environment. Well, I say we can make money out of that as well. You know, we can charge people more for water. We can fix the water. And you're saying it's going to bugger up the climate. Well, I'm saying that's brilliant. We can make a lot of money out of that as well, engineering the climate. And, you know, you don't like it? Well, we can get security and we can make good money out of that, keeping you lot down. So, you know, where do we stand with these people? OK, um, let, let's... I, I would take a... The, the last question of this round is the woman with her hand very high in the air there. Go for it. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, you're talking about revolution. Um, I think that this can be done on a local level. Well, you, just do, you just do not buy into anything that you're offered. Don't drive a car. Wear sweaters. Be careful with the water. Turn the lights off. Just save energy. Every, if every single person took responsibility for that, we'd put them all out of business, you know? <laughs> uh, we might as well start at the end. I mean, that, that's you, Millie. That, that, that chimes with your... Um, think local. Um, think community, think individual. Yeah, think community, I think chimes with me. Um, so, yeah, I sympathise with lots of what people were saying just now, and I think... Um, the younger generation feels especially betrayed by the political class who just don't represent us. And, you know, recently we, we were lied to about tuition fees. Um, so I think lots of young people, and lots of young people don't vote now, like lots of young people feel completely um, alienated from politics and just don't understand, you know, they see climate change happening. I've been learning about climate change at school all my life and not seen it being solved. I remember learning about it in primary school and thinking, why, isn't, why aren't we solving it then? Um, so I think a lot of us have just got to the point of thinking we need to build the solutions ourselves. And that's why I'm involved in doing, setting up the Energy Corp in Hackney and working with the community in Balcombe because we've got to just build these solutions ourselves. The political class don't represent us. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'll just take the, the, the questions in order. Um, I'll just contribute one thing from the chair. I had one idea, which I hope one day somebody will embrace. And that is on the question of, of uh, um, insulating homes. You have two million people unemployed. It should be possible to develop squads of people who are unemployed, and instead of paying them benefit, pay them at least the living wage, to join squads supervised by uh, perfectly competent uh, leadership and take them on inventories of every house in the country. You can run a census, so why can't you run a survey of every house in the country? And you build an inventory of every house, every house that requires insulation. And insulation is actually a terribly easy job. I mean, the injecting into the walls is a bit tricky, but you could get people to do that. What you really need is the people to do the roof and the, uh, you know, the whole business of unrolling the filthy old um, fiberglass stuff. Um, and that could be done. And not a hugely skilled job. I think I'm right in saying it. Am I not? Um, can everybody do that? Right. Every one degree you reduce the temperature of your house, you save 10% on space heating because it's non-linear. So if you turn it down to an average 16 degrees, you can knock up to half off your space heating bill. But that means insulating the bits that matter and not the building. You need to wear sensible clothes indoors. And this is a problem. We, the, the whole argument presupposes a certain set of economic relations and, and fashion and that sort of thing. And we've had this idea of voluntary simplicity. The bit we're missing out on is involuntary simplicity. America, in the re last few years, America has saved 16% of its energy consumption. 
Britain has saved 12% of its energy consumption. How did they make that startling change? Recession. If you could engineer a recession without the negative social impacts, we can massively reduce resource use and carbon emissions. But that is not on the agenda. Now, if you look at the very early founders of economics, John, um, Adam Smith, uh, John Stuart Mill, they all believed the economy would grow and then stop and level out. It's the first budget in Britain where growth was the policy was Rab Butler's budget of 1954. Before that, the policy was balanced in the books. Growth is a very modern concept that is not based in physical reality. And that's a discussion we really need. So, um, we've, we've dealt with Iceland, and, and, and I now want to turn to capitalism, which embraces both corruption and money. John, just with a little bit of trepidation, I, I'm, I'm glad that you've come back to that question. Um, we're locked into a system which assumes that if you can't put a price on something, it has no value. And we all know that's nonsense. We all know that's nonsense. And furthermore, it's a system which, whether by accident or design, I don't think many people really want to go to their grave troubled by the kind of what's on their conscience from it. But it's evolved so that it's created a kind of self-reinforcing machine based on plunder. It plunders resources from poor people who are not well organized, who don't have much political power, um, so that more of them go to rich people who are well organized and who can manipulate the way markets work in their interests. And it, which is an old problem. That's a problem that's been going on for centuries, and it's under current debate at the moment because of the recent book by the French economist Thomas Piketty. But there's a new problem on top of that, which is that the same machine also plunders resources from natural systems, beyond the point where those natural systems can recover. And that's what the climate problem is all about. If you destabilize the climate, you can't get that back. It doesn't matter how much, it's irreversible to all intents and to all intents and purposes. And so that, if we, st I mean, it's like being sort of chained to a wild animal. In, in, in Europe, in, I was in China the other day, you get a sense that if we're chained to a tortoise, China is chained to a, a tiger, but it's a wild animal that we can't control and it threatens to pull us over a precipice. So I kind of agree with where you're coming from, but I'm also very disturbed by the implications because if you're going to pull down a system, you better have a pretty good idea of what you want in its place. And you better know how to do, you better know how to do the politics, you better know how to do the politics to build it, because otherwise it ends in tears. And if you don't believe me, go to China and talk to the people who experienced the land reform and the Great Leap Forward and the Great Cultural Revolution and the Gang of Four. So, you know, it, it's not easy, but the, the particular bit of it that we're talking about is actually doable, and it's doable within a generation with the resources that we have, and I think that we will find that as we do it, we will learn again about the value of things that don't have a price, and we will be building a new impulse that will make this country in all kinds of other ways a better place, as well as fixing the immediate energy and climate problem. Um, uh, Michael. Michael, uh, you know about capitalism because you used to be a capitalist. In fact, yeah, you probably still are. Um, but you know about capitalism, but you also know probably about hemp. Could you hemp, hemp it up a bit? Uh, yes, indeed. Well, it's a, a crop uh, which, like all crops, will take solar energy, sunlight, and convert it into biomass. Uh, and then you use that biomass to generate heat and, and electricity. Um, one of the issues there as a... As a solution for Britain is the amount of agricultural land that is available and also the fact that uh, photosynthesis uh, as, a, as a mechanism for converting sunlight into energy is actually pretty poor. It's only about at most 3 to 4 percent efficient um, and the solar panels that we're now manufacturing are already uh, 19, 20 percent efficient and the ones in the pipeline are 31 percent which is the, was the theoretical maximum and now they're going above that because they're actually able to capture more parts of the solar spectrum, more parts of the wavelength of light, um, so that we're actually now looking at 45% efficiencies. So as a solution, 
Um, it, it is part of the biomass solution, but at a, at a sort of national level, um, I think it would be preferable to put solar panels, very highly efficient solar panels, on commercial roof space, on contaminated land, wherever we, we, don't, we don't need the space, um, along highways, and on reservoirs that are not used for sailing and recreation. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm just going to ask Paul very quickly to answer radon. Radon. Uh, increased radiation from radon is a hazard. It's more of a hazard than earthquakes but actually it's dwarfed by the increased hazard from road traffic accidents due to all the lorries going to and from the fracking sites. Um, Tina Louise, you want to say something? When we were talking about um, revolution and change, but we're also here to talk about fracking, I think the two come together very beautifully. We're just recently in our groups, because we've been growing so numerous in our communities, we've watched the absolute beauty of waking up the inner activist in people you would never imagine to become active in a community. And people coming together and not saying, what's your politics, you know, who did you vote for, who's your god, who did you think should win X Factor and what's your football team? None of them asked those questions. They looked at the problem which was fracking and said we need to stop this and the only way we do it is together. And each of these communities self-activated. And I've seen so much power in the way that they're scaring people. We've been told asked repeatedly by our media and by the industry itself, why don't you just become one group? Then we would be able to speak to you, you know, just one spokesperson. And we said that we didn't need one spokesperson because you could ask Paddy down in Balcombe or you could ask Foxy over at the Barton Moss site or you could ask me or Vanessa or anyone. We have one bucket of truth and one bucket of questions and it's all the same. We don't need to cover our, our backs by having one PR spokesperson to tie it all together. But you know that whole change that we're looking for comes down to what Millie said. You power a community. You don't say oh the lights are gone again and no offence Nick but you know we're here to talk about fracking and you seem to direct the conversation away from that like we find with all industry people that we've been trying to engage with. I don't mean to isolate you, it must be awful, and I think you're very brave to come into the room, and thank you for being here. But like Millie said, you power a community, and we start doing that. And I think that's where your revolution grows from the bottom up. That, that I just want to... I just want to say this is really what we need to be focused on is building community. That is essential and, and that's what everybody everywhere in the world should be focused on. But just to address the radon question, there's um, the radioactive material that comes back in um, flow back fluid from, from fracking. Depending on what water you test in Pennsylvania, right, uh, that's been, that contains flow back fluid. Um, it, it could range, the levels of radium will range from 400, 242 times to 3,609 times the safe level of the, the federal standard for safe drinking water. That's level of radium in drinking water in Pennsylvania, depending on you know, whether it's been impacted by fracking or not. Thank you very much. I mean, um, we're going to take another pool of questions a moment, but there's a very prominent hand up in the front row. So I'm going to invite Vivian Westwood to have a word with us. Thank you. It's going to take a minute, so I'll just turn this way. I, I want particularly to engage this gentleman as well in, in the answers, but I, it, it, is, it is, I'm making a point, but I'm also asking about the point I'm making as well. So I don't think that we have really um, answered the question of energy security and the idea that uh, we've got this energy security uh, but through fracking fracking will give us energy security and the first thing I want to say is that um, the government's statements are very emotional and they have been <clears throat> making us feel quite safe um, sorry, security me means that you feel safe and that you're not frightened so much anymore and the government's going to look after you and keep you secure. And, and the implication there somehow is that this gas that they can get out of the rocks when they frack them is ours. Now then, why is that gas ours? Why is it different um, than what usually happens. What usually happens is that it belongs to the people 
who have the concession to frack. And they put it in their portfolio, along with conventional fuels, and they sell it to the highest bidder. And it's quite possible that in between 10 to 15 years, when they're ready to do that, that solar will be in competition with this, and it might even be the cheapest energy that there is. And so, um, if they do have it in their portfolio, I assume that it's going to have to be subsidized to be in there. And this is one thing. So I want to ask, is this, is this what other people think would be the case? It's not our energy. It doesn't make me feel secure. And the other thing is that um, bridging a gap here, um, well, what about all the gas that you can get by conventional methods? It doesn't have to come from Putin. There's lots of it everywhere. And we've been told that if we, ta if we take the oil and the gas that you get by conventional extraction, if you take out more than 20%, then you go into irreversible climate change. It goes faster. You, you can only take 20% of it. So why can't we use that in the meantime instead of getting this special gas that will be far more difficult to get? And, and the last thing is that um, this gentleman is saying that in order to get um, renewables, that this might, would it cost more or are we waste, are we really, I think the argument is, is economic. I think you can argue this economically. Is it really going to cost more to get renewables? I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Well, I just want to get uh, John and Michael to respond to Vivian, and then I will come and get a pool of questions from you. Um, John. Um, Energy security. Well, I mean, first of all, I just uh, thank you, uh, Dame Vivian, for all of the activism and commitment that you've contributed. The, you, the way you're using your voice, I think, is really helpful in our national conversation. And I just want to pay tribute to that. But just. To, to, pick up, to pick up just one piece of what you said about, about solar, solar energy. In the last few weeks, we've had the chief executives of Germany's two largest uh, electricity generators, two largest utilities, RWE and E.ON, both effectively saying in public that the business model on which their businesses are based is collapsing because of the rate at which the cost of solar photovoltaic panels has come down. The cost of solar PV has fallen much faster than even the most optimistic experts uh, were predicting a few years ago. It's fallen partly because of the, um, the, the market acceleration support, the subsidies, the feed-in tariffs in Germany, but it's actually fallen much more because of the enormous effort that China has put into uh, accelerating the growth in markets for solar, for solar panels. Um, and um, the same thing is happening in America. Wall Street is now warning that the business models of American utilities are in jeopardy and the cost of borrowing for those companies is rising as a result. And if you thought the banks were too big to fail, um, if you listen carefully, you can hear the utilities telling us that they're also too big to fail and we need to slow down on this acceleration of low carbon uh, energy systems in order to preserve their business models. Um, we can have what we want. It depends how we use our voices. And this is, as, as Tina Louise has been saying so eloquently, this is not just about our energy system. This is about whether we want to take our politics back from the very small, um, mutually reinforcing, self-serving elite, which at the moment seems to be taking all the decisions, centered on this little part of this city, but above all, centered on this region of our country. As I travel around, it doesn't feel to me as if I live in a single country anymore. There's the southeast, which kind of bosses everything um, and wants to build a certain kind of economy, which is essentially speculative. And there's the rest of, a, of the country where the real economy used to, used to um, live and, and which is actually facing a huge opportunity to rebuild it. The building a low-carbon energy system um, is something that we would do nationally and it would be the most revitalizing thing we could do for our economy. Just before I go... Just before I go back to Michael, uh, Paul has a few figures he just wants to put in. You remember last year that they said we had 1,300 trillion cubic feet of gas in the Boland Shale. 
That's a 50-50% figure. There's a 50% probability of that. And if you were to go to the stock exchange as a company, you wouldn't be allowed to use that figure. You would have to use the 90% certain figure, which is only 820-something. 800, now, of that, we might get 1% or 2%. If you annualise that over 20, 30 years, then it's never going to be more than 5 or 10% of our annual energy production from shale. Now, we are losing more than that every year as North Sea declines. Uh, you might want to, Nick, you might want to comment on that, but it, it's irrelevant. Fracking is just irrelevant. Um, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, just to um, confirm what John was saying about the uh, potential of solar and where solar is going, um, already uh, southern Italy is at grid parity. Um, it's actually cheaper to put in solar panels um, than it is to burn coal uh, or gas. So there are large parts of Spain, Italy, the United States, if you take the panhandle of Texas alone, um, you cover that with solar panels, you're powering up all the electricity needs of the United States forevermore. So there are all sorts of amazing things that can happen with technology if we have the political will. Um, the signal that I'm seeing in the world is that absolutely the price of solar panels is coming down, they'll continue coming down. There's all sorts of amazing things in the pipeline in terms of the efficiency of those panels I've referred to earlier. Um, the problem here is that we don't have enough insulation. In other words, we don't have enough solar rays hitting the surface to actually make it viable for the near future until the efficiency is hit about 45%. We're at about 20% at the moment, so we've got a way to go. Um, but that said, we can be doing amazing deals with our friends in Spain, in southern, southern Spain and southern Italy, with a smart grid. Um, you could even get, and I could foresee a time when we've got, uh, you know, if, if we look at, you know, our dependency on, or European, I shouldn't say our, but European dependency on Russian energy, um, you know, if I was Angela Merkel, I, I'd be putting a lot more attention onto a, a, a high voltage direct current cable under the Mediterranean uh, to friends in Morocco and looking at solar potential in Morocco at huge scale. But that needs political will, as John's talked about. Um, and I think that that's the pith that's been missing from our politics across the whole of Europe. And I think that's because uh, we, the people, uh, are not making our voices heard clear enough. And I think we, the people, need to stand up and make our voices heard very, very clearly. Let's just go for some questions now. Let's go from questions from the pool. Uh, and I had the hat before, so I have to let other people have a go. Um, we'll, we'll take the, the woman with the high hand there. Uh, uh, the salmon here is next. Yes, you are salmon. Yeah. Uh, let's hear from salmon first. Go on. Hello. It's on. Um, hi, my name is Julie Wasmer. I am a Kent campaigner. Um, East Kent against fracking is one of the very few groups in this country that has successfully fought applications for extreme energy exploration in this country uh, before drilling took place. And we, we, we won on that because we had the findings of a respected hydrogeologist from the Campaign for Protection of Rural England, Kent, who showed that um, fracking in East Kent would um, could, had a very clear risk of irreversibly contaminating an aquifer that served 90% of that county with water. Now, since that campaign, I now sit on the Environment Committee of the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, and I can tell you clearly that anyone who has studied this issue in the last few years will know that the conflicts of interest are rife between industry and between our government. We do not have a government that is committed to renewables, to an alternative. And only last week, I saw a photograph of a senior member of our Kent CPRE with Eric Pickles. And on Sunday, Eric Pickles, of course, rejected a large scale solar application and has threatened to re um, refuse further ones. Now, I find it a really disturbing irony that the chairman of Rathlin Energy can actually be the chairman of CPRE North Ants. Not only that, I discovered last week 
that he was part of the task and finish group that decided on the CPRE policy against fracking. CPRE are not part of the Are We Fit to Frack report. They did not sign up to that, along with many other wildlife trusts. Okay. What we have is a conflict of interest, but in spite of the proponents of fracking, and we've heard one tonight, I just want to say that communities like mine know that there are alternatives, we know that there is another way, and we will continue to pursue it. Correct. So I thank Talk Fracking for this debate, because we're not having it from our government. Thank they you. do not initiate it, and they do not participate in it, and shame on them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let, let's take, take the one there. Hi there. And I then, just want to say, I think what we're seeing is the death throes of the Industrial Revolution. I think the carbon-based revolution that we've seen is dying. Yeah, and what we need to do is we need to force the next revolution. And sometimes when you've got capitalist organisations that have gained their money in 200 years of raping other people's countries for fuel, and we're actually made to feel scared that we don't have fuel and we might not have heating, we might, that's rubbish. You know, we've got to a stage now where this industrial system, which is based on hierarchy and capitalism, has to change. And sometimes, my question is to you, we want democracy, but at some point in our history, we have to say, no, this is not about democracy, this is about changing things, stopping these companies from ruining our future for generations ahead of us. So actually, we're at a tipping point now that if we don't take, stop taking this stuff out of the earth, we are not going backwards. And the industrial revolution in capitalism is actually dying. And we need to know the, how we're going to get through this. And an infrastructure has to be built now, however much it costs. OK. We, 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 we've had a couple of very eloquent statements, but we do need just to have some brisk, specific questions that can keep the debate going. So. Ma'am, there, you go for it. I'd like to speak about health, which is the people, as I understand, the biggest fracking place I know of is Alberta Tar Sands, yes? And at Leprechaun Lake, which is on the Alberta Tar Sands area, there are a lot of Lakota tribe living, traditionally. And since the tar sands have been opened up and mined, they're now experiencing cancer at 10 times the national Canadian average. And this is an official figure, not an unofficial figure. So could someone explain to me how we can accept that as an example if we're going to lose our land and our health? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take the, the woman in yellow here. And then we'll come down here. Then what, 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 the one with the hand up. Hi, wow. I'm Janelle Racco. I live on the South Downs, which is a national park of outstanding natural beauty. All of the UK is precious to wh whoever and wherever they live. Um, my main issue of concern is the area that I live in, particularly, is a drought area. And where do they believe that the water is going to come for the potential fracking sites? And also, where will the contaminated water be be left or be going after the fracking. Our families... Uh, uh, there was a report the other day that suggested the weald was not going to be very productive, yeah? Yes, but well, we've got three applications on there now. Yes. Yeah, but, right. The, the report's come out since the applications, though. Yes, the Paul, no, just, just the clarify. Weald, stay where you are, love. The yep. weald is fracking for oil. Uh, or it's tight oil which they're trying to enhance by fracturing the rock. Um, it has a much lower prospectivity. They could get less back. But if oil prices go up any higher, with the Iraq situation, for example, then it, it prices in doing that. So whether or not they go big in the wheel is really dependent on the global oil price. But if it were to go $140, $160 a barrel, provided the economy doesn't go boom in the meantime, then that's the sort of level they might come and look at that. Okay, but the point you've raised is water, and I'll get that addressed, okay, because I'm going to try and ask a couple of people who are involved in the fracking industry to speak to that. But the, recent fracking, uh, the recent figures on that was 0.1% of oil in our area. 
Um, so it's not going to be even beneficial for them to be drilling for oil there. Okay. And I speak on behalf of the rest of the country that have drought areas. The, obviously, the area where I live in will be the area that I can campaign the most. But this, this is a very important issue as also as to where these waters are going to be stored or dumped. The, um, the wider implications basically boil down to the government really not caring. There is so much personal investment within the government that the, all of these issues are down to money and profit and gain for themselves. Okay, fine. Thanks. Yeah, in a moment. I'm going to take... This is the last one of this particular... I'm not quite sure... What, what, what time do you want us to finish? Anybody know that? What, are we going to cut off? Five minutes? Good God. Go for it. Hi. Um, we heard from various members of the panel that the establishment road rush shot over its own rules in the build-up and now and possibly in the future of, of fracking in this country. Um, as soon as you grasp philosophically in your head, in your own head, that under this system, all decisions will be made based on profit margins, on who owns the land, and not what's best for communities, individual people, or wildlife habitats. As soon as you've grasped that, then are we not forced to accept that the very nature of our current system where the House of Lords are at once landowner and lawmaker and the highest court in the land is just not good enough for anyone here on earth and the whole of the land? Right. We've, we need we've a, got... We need a conscious we, revolution we, I'm change, afraid we right? have five minutes and we've had a panel here and I want one other contribution from the Instagram. Just wondering whether Mark Linder is here, whether he would want to answer a question. Do, can you answer the question about water? And, and what, what uh, that was the question that the yellow jersey... Could you send a mic, a mic to Mark? And again, thank you very, very much for being prepared to say anything. Hi there, thank you. Um, so the question is, in, in, a, uh, in an area where the water is tight supply, how's that regulated? Well, all the water is is controlled by the um, local utility and the water use has to be approved by the environment agency and there's very clear set of guidelines about that there'd be no way that if there's a water constrained situation that this would be approved so the regulators are completely in control of that it's not looking too good for drilling in in, in the south downs um but i want now just to finish off with the panel uh, and and um so a very very brief health health who would like to speak to the health issues? I, I can speak to some of the health issues. Um, we, we've seen a lot of health impacts. I've named some of the symptoms earlier, but um, it's, it, we should be living by the precautionary principle when it comes to public health and our water supply. Fracking cannot be done safely when you have a 5% failure rate immediately and a 50% failure rate within 30 years. I will be alive for another 30 years and another 30 years after that. So that means I'm potentially seeing all of these wells fail in my lifetime, and that is not something I'm comfortable with, and not something any of us should be comfortable with, because no place on this planet should be a sacrifice zone. I think we're all willing to sacrifice somebody else as long as it's not ourselves, and we can't live like that, because this, in, this, this is touching all of us. So there, yes, we need epidemiological studies, and, and, and they take a long time, and in the meantime, we should not be risking other people's health. We have too much evidence now from Pennsylvania alone, not to mention the rest of the uh, areas that are being fracked, and, and it's, it's just not safe. We, can, we shouldn't do it. Oh, fine. Fine, no, okay. Um, uh, John, a final word. You got anything you want to say? Just... Um just on the health thing, very briefly, I mean, that clearly there, there are quite a lot of very important questions about the physical health and actually the mental health consequences of fracking, which are not, I mean, to the extent that we're having a conversation at all beyond this room, they're not yet part of the conversation. And they are really serious issues and they need to be. We need to hear from health experts um, uh, and have a really serious effort. In, in, in some ways, I think that's even more important than the climate dimension, because it's so real for, for people. Uh, but but the, the, the other point, the bigger point, I mean, the, there's, just contrasting this, the, the, the sense I get from those people I 
talk to who were around in the late 40s and early 50s and who were inspired by the national mood at that time was actually there was a lot of a sense of common purpose, a sense that we'd been through something terrible which mustn't happen again, um, and a willingness to listen to each other with respect and to try and build something together. And there's a lot of anger in this debate. Um, and anger is understandable. There, there are good reasons. People don't feel ang angry just for no reason. There's, there's real reason. But I do think that we need to find ways at least of channeling our anger for constructive purposes. I think everybody who feels angry will contribute more to this, and I feel angry, if we can find ways of using it to bring people together, together rather than drive them apart. Well, look. You uh, expect that from a diplomat, perhaps. Uh, I'm just a hack, and of course the media has a lot to answer for, and that I, I fully accept, and uh, we all have our shortcomings. However, I did go to Greenland um, two months ago with Ban Ki-moon to look at climate change. I was very lucky to go. Only three hacks were able to get on the trip because transport's very difficult. Um, but what I did witness was something shocking, the, the breakup of the pack ice, the uh, disintegration of uh, glaciers, the invasion of local people's uh, way of life. Um, it's a hunting way of life, and uh, it's dependent upon fixed ice for fixed periods of the year, and those fixtures have all withered and we have a crisis. There is no question about that. That is a dispassionate, objective view from a hack. Uh, my other uh, view as a hack, objectively, as the, from this chair, is that this debate it needs to be much wider than merely hacking and, flack, and, 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 and fracking. In fact, not about just uh, the media and all the rest of it, and not just about fracking, but about climate change and the immediate massive urgency to do something about it. Now, Ban Ki-moon, with whom I had conversations on this trip, it was amazing to have access to a man for three days. Um, he is trying to have this debate right now in this year. Uh, he has arranged for a whole slew of climate change summits in the margins of the General Assembly meeting in September. He's then pushing on to Peru, pushing on to Paris. Paris, I think you'll agree, and Michael, is an absolutely pivotal moment. And if you want to concentrate your energies in terms of trying to bring about change, then you need to influence the people who are going to Paris in 2015 to draw up this new international, intercontinental, inter-multinational, even believe it, agreement on where energy is to go, where climate change is to go. So there are mechanisms in play, but nobody's really kind of playing to them, and they need to. So... Uh, my observation is merely, obviously, in the communities that are affected by fracking, fracking is a, is a huge issue. I hope that the next meeting, which is going to be held, will include the industry, will include other people who are uh, concerned about climate change and concerned about bringing about changes in the way in which Britain is responding to this, uh, will also be here at the, at the meeting. But on your behalf, before I introduce the room, I'd like to thank our panel very, very warmly, and I'd like to thank you for uh, your participation in today and your tolerance of other people's views. And for those people that have braved the, uh, the storm and been prepared to offer their expertise in terms of their knowledge of fracking, I'd like to thank them too very warmly. So Vivian, let me hear it from you. I um, am supposed to read out this letter that we sent to the press, which really is a summing up what this um, event is about. But I would like to just say one or two things first. And, um, the, the, yeah, hope. We do hope we haven't passed the tipping point. Let's just hope we haven't. Um, our, every government, if we, if we still have hope, then let's say that every government in the world is taking us nearer and nearer to that point in everything they do. And so I do believe that this particular specific question about fracking is the most important issue that, um, that will face the British people ever. 
And, and, and I think that I say that is because we've got to start somewhere. And we have to start now. I mean, and that's why this particular issue is where we've got to start. We have got to get governments to start to listen to people. And um, so why don't we start here and let China copy us. Let everybody copy us. Let's start. Um, right, so I guess I'm going to just read out this, this letter. Um, and um, yeah, there's one thing that I quite like to say, which is it would echo a lot what John is saying. Uh, the, the way out of this is if we could put into practice what's good for the planet is good for the economy. What's bad for the planet is bad for the economy. That's all we need to get people to do. And I want to say, moreover, what's good for the planet is good for people. It will, if we put this into practice, we will start to get our human values actually working instead of being frustrated all the time. Okay, um, right, so I'll read this letter now. I have recently returned, oh, this is going to the press, and um, my son Joe wanted me to say one other thing as well, which I forgot, which is that um, Medac, 2,000 doctors, did sign our letter saying we need to talk about fracking before the government goes ahead and does anything, so I wanted to say that. Right. I've, I'm going to read it really quickly. It, I had a great time. I've recently returned from... Fr I've recently returned from travelling to towns around the UK. This is going to, it's gone to the press, this letter, on the talk fracking tour, which sought to provide a forum for a debate with a panel of leading voices on both sides of the argument for and against fracking. Um, I don't think I need to read this. It's just summing up what we've been talking about, that we wanted to invite people. They didn't come. And this is alarming because pe most people don't know about it. This is what the letter is saying. And that the government's in the process right now of licensing up to 65% of the UK landmass, um, changing the law on trespass. I've spoken to people who touchingly said that they'd changed their mind, pro-fracking, changed their mind to, um, not, uh, to against fracking um, because they said there were so many people there who were so upset and concerned about it and it's just really terrible that the government isn't listening to them so now I'm not pro-fracking anymore, that's what they said. Anyway, um, so... Our, our debate in London today, Monday the 16th of June, will go ahead as planned with Jon Snow tonight, steering the discussion instead of chairing the debate we had wished for. Anyway, but we still want to give, the, in the interests of our democracy, we want to give the policy makers of government and industry a further opportunity to take part so we have rebooked the Central Hall, Westminster, in a month's time on July the 14th, and we are hopeful that this time they will attend. We will ensure that these debates are kept free and open to the public. I want to thank everybody incredibly for coming. Without public opinion, we don't stand a chance. And thank you very much to John. Um, yeah, and thank you.